Well, hello and good evening. Today is uh, Friday the 10th of April uh, 2020 and uh, we are here with uh, Biblical Foundations class tonight. I pray that you had a blessed day, a wonderful time out, um, enjoying some of this weather maybe in, in your yards and uh, hopefully uh, you just uh, gave God the praise and the glory for how wonderful of a day it was today. Well, praise the Lord. You got to turn this light on. Okay. Well, um, so today we're going to get into the scriptures. Um, we're going to take a little bit of time and and go before the Lord. It's some good news. Uh, Marie uh, Maynard, who we were praying for yesterday, who wasn't feeling well, um, she's feeling much better today. And so we can just th be thankful and praising God for that. So keep your prayers going. You know, there, there are a lot of people out there who need um, who need prayer. And so um, you keep praying for them and they will you'll see the Lord work in a, in a lot of powerful and unexpected ways at times. So um, today, let's go to the Lord before we start in prayer. Uh, dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this night. We thank you for how you've just preserved and kept us uh, throughout this day. Lord God, I pray for each one that's tuning in tonight, that's listening, uh, wherever they may be. Please keep them safe and um, in their families, Lord, from uh, this virus that's going on. And Lord God, most especially of all things, I pray that uh, that everyone who listens in would would come to know you as Savior and Lord. I pray today that uh, they would have a relationship with you and put their faith and trust in you. Lord, that I thank you for repentance. I thank you the ability that we have to be able to repent of our sins and trust Jesus Christ. Lord, we, we are so grateful, so thankful for you and for your word tonight. And Lord, we just thank you for all the good things that you're doing in, in our lives and through the situation that's going on. We just thank you. We ask that you would please uh, bless and give wisdom and understanding to our national leaders and the president, uh, uh, you know, all of the, uh, you know, all of the Congress, Senate, the judicial system, and on down to the states, the governors, and give them wisdom and understanding, Lord, uh, to what things they should be doing and, and, and how to uh, follow you. Lord, I pray they would follow you. I ask that your blessings would be upon the doctors and nurses uh, throughout this nation, throughout the world that are helping and aiding uh, people that are ill tonight. And God, I pray for a quick um, resolution of all this virus that's attacking uh, throughout the world. I just pray that you would preserve your people, Lord, tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so tonight we are going to go into the scriptures and we're going to take a look at a few things. So if you have... Um, and you, as you know, this week we've been talking a, a lot about um, we've been talking about the Last Supper, the um, crucifixion of Christ. Sunday morning we're going to talk about the resurrection of Christ. And I want to add a few other things in here that we need to talk about and take a look at tonight. So if you have your Bible, uh, could you turn to Zechariah? Zechariah is in the Old Testament, and it's chapter twelve that we're going to look at. So Zechariah chapter twelve in the Old Testament. And specifically, we're going to take a look all the way down to verse 10. But before we get to that, um, we're going to look a little bit uh, ahead of that, verse 9. We're going to take a look at 9 and 10, and uh, we'll see what it says here. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all nations that come against Jerusalem, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So, you know, two things in this that I want you to pay real close attention to. The first part of this is that it says in that day, uh, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all nations that come against Jerusalem. So, you know, for uh, national preservation there, I would suggest that no nation comes against um, comes against Jerusalem, comes against Israel to, to do them harm. Uh, the Bible said to Abraham, the promise that God gave to Abraham, the Bible says that, um, that God would bless those who bless him and curse those who curse him. And uh, so you cannot really... <laughs> go against uh, God's chosen people without having uh, 
a big problem. And, and so I would say that, you know, we're supposed to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, the Bible tells us. The Bible also tells us that Jerusalem would be a, um, a cup of trembling to all people. You know, and uh, it would say here, matter of fact, if you want to look at that verse, uh, let's go up in chapter 12. Um, let's see. We'll look at verse, starting at verse 1. Just want to show you just a couple verses there, and then we'll get back to our study here. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretches forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered against it, you know, gathered together against it. In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness, and I will open my eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of, of hosts, their God. In that day will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in the sheaf. And they shall devour all the people round about, on the right hand and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. And the Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will, that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, and I will pour out, I'll pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So looking at this, you know, you see that in the last days that, that Israel, especially Jerusalem, Israel is, Jerusalem itself is, you know, a cup of trembling to all people, you know, and it's, and it calls here, it calls here Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people, and so you start uh, having to understand that you cannot, um, you cannot come against God's uh, people and, and expect that God's going to bless you. It's not going to work that way, and this is why, you know, today we see this, we see this going on, really, um, that, that Jerusalem is a is a cup of trembling. Still, you know, even in these times that are going on with this virus around the world, eyes are still on Israel. You know, still always on on God's chosen people. God is going to do an amazing work there. But you know, um, going back to our verse ten, uh, when it says, "I will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they pierced." And mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. I'd like you to take a look over to John's Gospel, John uh, chapter 19. I want you to remember that that scripture we just were at, just keep you could even probably just keep you know keep your place there. We can refer back to it. But John chapter 19, verse 34. Through 37. But one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith is true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, They shall look upon him whom they pierced. You know, Talking about, you know, John, he brought this scripture out, this connection here in Zechariah uh, that Christ would be pierced, and he was pierced uh, upon that cross after he had died, actually. Uh, the Romans stuck that spear into his side, and out came blood and water. And as we talked about earlier, um, that is a sign, uh, uh, an actual scientific sign, that the pericardium around the heart had burst, you know, and he was dead. 
that blood and water coming out uh, signified this. Now, there's another part of that that you need to look at. So going back over to Zechariah, in that part of where it says, um, and they shall look up, look on me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son. So that is also referring, it's referring in two parts. One, about the fact that he had been pierced, and we see that in the book of John, we see what at the crucifixion after Jesus had died, they did this. Um, you know, he was pierced. But he, this right here, the second part of this verse in Zechariah, and they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. That hasn't happened yet. And what that part is, is when the return of Christ, when Christ comes to rescue them, when Jerusalem is surrounded by their enemies, and their enemies are about to destroy them, Jesus Christ himself comes and rescues them. He comes to rescue the children of Israel. Well, when this happens here in the scripture, it says they'll look on him who they pierced. They're going to recognize who he is. This is Jesus. This is the one that we rejected. This is the one that we turned away. And this is the one who is God come to rescue them. Their Messiah. You know, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And he is the one, the promised one. He is the chosen one. He is the one who was, who, who was, was promised to, not only to Israel, but he promised to Abraham. And through him, all nations of the world would be blessed. This, this morning, can, can you only just grasp it? You know, how, how deep of a morning that will be to, to think that all of the history that's happened in Israel since um, since Christ was was here before in his first coming all of the history that's happened to Israel all the tragedy the tragic things that have happened to them because they rejected Jesus Christ and look at the mercy of God where he ex still extends mercy to his people he still loves them he still extends his hand to to save if you go to Isaiah chapter 53, I'd like to show you this. Now, a couple of interesting things. I posted something today and um, earlier, and I don't know if you had a chance to ever look at it, but um, very interesting interviews that were going on in Israel uh, some time ago. And basically, these interviews are going on from a, a Messianic Jewish uh, man who was he had come to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior, and he's interviewing um, Jewish people from you know cross section of their society, uh, different you know from very um, very or you know ultra orthodox uh, to you know somebody who's not so much uh, deep in the faith, um, but he's interviewing them and talking about Isaiah chapter fifty three specifically. Because Isaiah 53 is no longer uh, mentioned or taught in, in many of the synagogues. The, the rabbis, they don't talk about this, this particular chapter. They avoid this chapter for, for a reason that will be very obvious once we read this. So let's read it together. Isaiah chapter 53, starting at verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. 
He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Look at this scripture. I mean, this is such a clear, clear picture of Jesus Christ. It becomes obvious because there's so many things that had to be fulfilled. Like he, you know, the Messiah, you know, was, was, um, it was prophesied. It was in the book of Daniel, you know, that the Messiah would come, you know, in exact timing of his coming would be before uh, this, you know, while the second temple was in existence before, before it was destroyed. So, you know, being destroyed in 70 AD, the Messiah had to come before that, that period of time. And when you go through that period of time and you look at somebody who is, you know, somebody who fits this exact description, born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, you know, um, there, there are very specific things that, that, that fulfilled, that Christ fulfilled so that they it pointed to the fact that he's the Messiah. And here, you know, he was despised and rejected of men. The man of sorrow is acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. I mean, this is what they did. They rejected him. They they turned away from him. And, and it says here that uh, he was... Um, oppressed and was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth and he was brought as a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before his shearers is dumb so he openeth not his mouth you know he his with his word you know with his word with christ's word because we read it and we read that in hebrews and we read it in john chapter one and we read it in genesis where you know it was christ through through his word created what everything he spoke he spoke everything into existence. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. He could have spoke those men out of existence that were trying to hurt him. He could have summoned, he could have called to God, and, and, and to the Father, and asked for 12 legions of angels to come. But had he done those things, the scripture wouldn't be fulfilled. So scripture was fulfilled because Christ was an obedient son. He did what the Father called him to do. What the Father told him to do, that's what he did. You know, this is a lesson for us as the church to obey our Lord Jesus Christ. That what he asks us to do, that's what we should be doing. That's what we need to do. We don't need to be doing our own thing out there. We need to do what Christ has called us to do. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what he's told us to do. That is the message of the hour, the message of the day. You know, I, I will tell you this, that during these times when things are tough, you know, people are more apt to seek the Lord. But the problem is, the problem is with mankind, and the perpetual issue with mankind is once things get better, man forgets God. Man turns away from God. You know, man uh, needs to get it together because man in his pride thinks that he's going to be around here forever, that he's, his life is not going to change, that it's, he's, today he's going to do this and tomorrow he's going to do that, and next week and next year. But that is not promised. Tomorrow's not promised. And the truth of the matter is, if you leave this planet without Jesus Christ, hell is your home. That's where you will spend eternity. And that's not what God wants for you. Jesus Christ came and he went through all of these things for you. He went through all these things. He was, he was cut off, the Bible says. He's cut off out of the land of the living. He was killed. Why was he killed? For the transgression of my people was he stricken, for their sin. 
You see, he was our substitute, a sinless son of God, our substitute on the cross. He bore our sins, carried our, our griefs. You know, he, he did it for us. He did it for us. It says here that it, the promise was great in verse 10. Um, Yet it pleases the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So after he goes through this, then what is it? He will see his seed. He, his, you know, he, will, he will prolong his days. This is talking about the resurrection here. It says, therefore, in verse 12, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and shall divide spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bare the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Here is showing here that, that he would do that for us. That he would, would die for us. He made intercession for us. I mean, he prayed for us, and he's still praying for us at the right hand of the Father. We, we get that you know from another scripture in the Word. And it says... Um, Look at verse 11. Just uh, go back to that. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. You know, only Christ, only Christ, his, his suffering and death on the cross could satisfy the claims of justice that was against our souls. You know that. The wages of sin is death. We were all all guilty of sin and every single one of us was was going to hell and had jesus christ not stepped in and and gave his life for our sins we would be lost eternally but because of the fact that he gave himself he suffered the wrath of god for us because he did that says the rest of that verse says by his knowledge shall he shall my righteous servant justify many or he shall bear their iniquities. Think about that. He bore our sins. He makes us righteous. It is not it is not our own righteousness. We have the righteousness of Christ. His righteousness. We can partake of that because we outside of Christ, man, we are we are absolutely corrupt. You know, we needed Jesus. God knows before he ever made anything that that we need a Jesus. And thank God we have Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Um, look at um, Psalm 69. Go to Psalm 69. And Psalm 69, we're going to take a look at um, verse... 21 it's, it's interesting here another verse that you know from the old testament that said what they would do before they did it psalm tw uh, 69 verse 21 says they gave me also gall for my meat and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink and we read just last night as we were reading the account of the crucifixion of christ how they they offered to him what vinegar and gall mixed together and he rejected it Right, but it's it's right here. This is what they gave him to drink, and and it's interesting that this psalm was written way before the Lord Jesus Christ was was born, and he came to uh, you know be born in Bethlehem and and live and in and was in Israel. I mean, this was way before then. It was way before then. What is God doing? Why does he show us these things? Why does he tell us in Daniel that the Messiah would come and be cut off? Why does he give us an exact time frame of when he would come the first time? Because so the people would know. Where did, why did they say where he'd be born? Why did, Herod, um, why did Herod, after interviewing the wise men that had come to worship the king of the Jews that was born following the star, why did he destroy all the babies in Bethlehem and the surrounding area two years old and under because that's the time frame that he got from the wise men think about it in the Old Testament it, it there was a prophecy that said that, that Rachel was weeping for her children and they were, and they were not all right, 
and she couldn't be comforted because they were not. They were dead. They were died. In the Old Testament, before it happens, God tells us always, tells us the end from the beginning. Tells us the end from the beginning. And this is why when you go to Revelation, and you, you look in Revelation, and you read, God tells you the whole story. He tells you exactly what he's going to do, how he's going to do it. He tells you, he gives you a picture of what's going on in heaven, you know, during during all of the tribulation period, what he, the the wrath, the bowls and the in the vials that is going to be poured out on the earth. He gives you an exact picture of all of it, and he tells you what's going to happen when Jesus Christ returns to the earth. He also tells you that how he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And he tells us too, um, and just just so you know, that the new heaven, the new Jerusalem, it uh, says, uh, verse, what is it? Uh, Revelation 21, verse 27 says, And there shall in no wise enter into it, into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. You want to you want to be there with the Lord? Your name's got to be written in the Lamb's book of life. Well, how does that happen? You need to repent. God commands men everywhere to repent, to trust Christ. And if you haven't repented and trust and put your trust in Christ, then you you have no hope. You have no hope without Christ. You know, uh, it's not enough to say, I know him. And then you don't obey him because then you're just lying. If you know him, then you obey him because, because the fact is that you want to keep his commandments. This is if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love him, then keep his commandments. If you keep in his commandments, you're obeying what he said. Amen. You put your faith and trust in Christ, repent of your sins, and after you do that, follow him, obey his word. You can't discount the Bible, you can't discount his word, you can't just do your own thing. It doesn't work like that. You know, uh, a lot of people out there doing their own thing. And it does not work like that. You know, read read what he says. Read what he says in the Bible. You know, get into the Bible. Get in there and find out what he says. You know, this is important stuff. Important for you to know. I want to point something out to here. Uh, talking about, um, we... We were talking about when Christ had the triumphal entry just a couple of days ago. We talked about that. And he rode into Jerusalem. Now, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 44. Ezekiel chapter 44 and verses uh, 2 and 3. Well, we read verse 1 too. It's important. Uh, then he brought me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, which looketh toward the east, and it was shut. And the Lord said, and then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. It is for the prince. The prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the porch of that gate and shall go out by the way of the same. Now, that eastern gate, that gate was the one that looks out towards the Mount of Olives. And that gate is today literally blocked up. And it was it was walled in. And uh, what's interesting is... In, uh, in 1543, uh, this man, the Sultan Suleiman, uh, the Magnificent, uh, actually closed the gate and walled it up. And it's been that way. It's still walled up today. That gate is the gate that Jesus Christ entered into on uh, when he, uh, during the triumphal entry, he entered that gate. And when he returns and he enters Jerusalem, because he's going to set his foot down on the Mount of Olives, it's going to split in half, and he is going to enter in through that gate. That's why um, the Islamic, the, the Muslim um, folks have put a cemetery right outside that gate to, to keep that way, you know, to keep uh, him from entering in that way. 
But that's not going to help. That's not going to stop the Lord either. Um, but it's quite interesting that the extent that people will go through to stop, try to stop God, they wall up the gate and they put a cemetery outside of it to keep, to keep the Lord out. If they didn't believe that he was coming back, why would they do that? Hmm? Got to ask yourself that question, right? No, they actually absolutely believe he's coming back. They do not want him to go in that way. The scripture says he's going to. The scripture that we just read said he's going to. It says, this gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened and no man shall enter it by it because the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered in by it and therefore it shall be shut. It is for the prince. The prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. This is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's quite interesting too that um, who entered that gate who went through that gate and that triumphal entry when they they were singing Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does it say here in that scripture? The Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Who entered into it? The God of Israel, Jesus Christ. That's who he is. He's the Messiah and he is the one that they were waiting for. And he And he came there, but they didn't receive him and they didn't accept him and they rejected him. And he is going to come back again. As we read in Zechariah 12.10, we were reading about that they're going to look on him whom they pierced. They're going to mourn for him. Why? Because they had missed him the first time. They had rejected him, but not anymore. When he returns to save Israel, he, there will be no more future rejection of him. Matter of fact, all the nations of the world will come before Christ when he rules and reigns in Jerusalem. All the nations of the world. Every leader, every knee bow, every tongue confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. You see, there's that day is coming, and that day is 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 soon approaching. You know, uh, say people say, well, when is it? Well, it's it's closer than it was yesterday, right? Every minute and every day brings us a moment closer to the time of Christ's return. We don't know the day or the hour, but we know that through the signs of the times that he has given to us, that that day is, is coming soon. We see apostasy rampant in the church today. People are doing their own thing rather than doing what the Bible says. They're not rightly dividing the word of truth. We see that happening over and over again from pulpits around the nation. We also see that uh, during these days, we see wars and rumors of wars. We see uh, famines and we see pestilence, which is disease. We see these things. But these things are going to continue to happen. They're going to continue to happen and in increase in frequency and in intensity. Now, I imagine right now you're thinking, oh, man, this, uh, this pandemic, this is horrible. I can't even imagine it getting worse than this. Well, let me just tell you, just like these birth pangs, they increase in frequency and intensity. This is bad. This is a bad thing that's going on in the world, but it can be worse. So during all these things that are happening, what is the condition of your heart? Where are you at with God? Are you taking this time to look at the things that are happening around you and say, Lord, you know, I want to be closer to you. I want to live a life that's pleasing to you. I want to, to follow you more completely. I want to make sure that my life is, is matching up to this Bible, to your word. Or are you doing your own thing? Because if you're out there doing your own thing, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. And when I say miss it, is you, you're, going to, you're going to be, if you're doing your own thing, rather than doing what God calls you to do, and you, and you say, I have my own way. I'm going to do my own thing. I know, you know, then be careful because Jesus said there'll be people, many, he says many, that'll come before him and say, Lord, we've done this. We've done that. We've done the other in, in your name. And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. If you're not obeying his word and you're not, then you're not, you're not following him. Even though you might say you are, if you're not obeying him, you're not. You have to obey his word. You have to follow Jesus Christ. That means not your will, but his will be done. It means that you have to humble yourself under his hand and follow Jesus Christ all the days of your life. That means that, that you put him first and yourself last. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Are you living that way? Even right now, locked up in your house, and in, are you living that way? Are you loving your neighbor? Are you loving God first? Are you, are you talking to people and calling them and giving them encouragement to follow Jesus, to, to obey his word? Are you talking to people about the Lord? There's a lot of people out there that, that are scared today. You know, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and sound mind. Again, you can talk to them that, about how caring and loving and kind the Lord is, how he's there for them, and he just wants them to turn and repent of their sin and trust Jesus Christ. If you, you would do that today, we could get this word out to so many people. More, more than you ever would just, just going to church. I thank God for going to church. I thank God that when things are, when we're able to, that we'll be able to gather together again. I thank God for that. But right now, I, I'm going to honestly tell you, I thank God for this. I thank God for this time. Why do I thank God for this time? Because this time the church is not in a building. They're out everywhere. And because we're out everywhere, we can bring the gospel everywhere. You know, in your home during this time, it is much like the time that you are, you are, you know, like, like Passover is much like that. You know, draw near to God during this time. You know, Psalm 91, one of my favorites, and, and I know it's been quoted a lot recently, lately it's been quoted a lot. I just want to point out one thing from that psalm, one thing, because people will like to claim a lot of stuff on that, that psalm, but I just want to point out the first thing, the first thing. Psalm 91, starting at verse 1, it says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. How do you say this? Because you are dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. You know, this is why Jesus illustrates to us about He's in the Father and the Father's in Him. This is why we need a relationship with Christ. We need to be born again so we're in Christ and Christ is in us. In that place, the secret place, in that place of the Most High, when we're dwelling close to Him. That's where God's your fortress. That's where He's your rock. That's where all of these things, if you're dwelling with Him, you know, this is, Satan will come at you, right? He's going to come at you with everything that he's got because his desire is to destroy you and destroy everyone that you love, everyone that you care about, any anything around. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he does. But the Bible says, what? Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. I'm going to tell you something. He's fleeing because you're submitting yourself to God. You are drawing your nigh to that secret place. You, you know, you're dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. It, he puts his, it says here, look at um, verse, verse 4. It says, He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Have you ever seen? Have you ever seen a, a a chick, a chicken? You know, protecting its young. You know, with its wings, putting its wings around a bird. Have you ever seen that where a bird will put its wings around its young to protect them and keep them safe? Have you ever seen it? It's, it's fantastic. And God wants to do this for you, but you can't be running off doing your own thing away from God. And, and expect that well, God's gonna God's gonna protect me. He's gonna keep me because you wait. You're outside of His will for you. You're running out there doing your own thing. You're not obeying His will. You're doing your thing, and then you you say that that you want that protection from the Lord. Well, I tell you what. Get back to this. Get back to His word. Get back to that relationship with Him. Get back to that close fellowship with the Lord. You can't do your own thing. And expect to be blessed. That's not how that works. Jesus didn't come doing his own thing. He came to do the will of the Father. And the will of the Father was that the Christ would go to the cross for us. That he would go to the cross and die for us in our place. Wow. And Christ went willingly as an obedient son. 
Now let me ask you, if God asks you to go somewhere, are you going? If God is telling you to wait on Him, to be patient, to be thankful in all things, are you being? Are you giving Him thanks through this time? Are you praising the Lord with all of your heart? Are you loving Him with all of your heart? Or are you doing your own thing during this time? Are you letting stress and worry and griping and murmuring and complaining get dominion over you? Because it shouldn't, right? It shouldn't. We're not called to gripe. We're not called to murmur. We're not called to complain. We're called to praise. We're called to be thankful, to be grateful, to be holy. That's what we're called to do. And so I'm asking you today to get your life lined up with his word, to live this way. If you sin, confess your sin to him. Ask forgiveness. He will forgive you. But don't think because you can do that, you have a license to sin because you don't have a license to sin. Okay? You know, we're not supposed to live that way anymore. Just because grace abounds doesn't give you a license to sin. Paul said, God forbid that. God forbid. You know, a person that that plays that way, you know, um, ends up paying a heavy cost sometimes. You know, there was a time where these kids used to, you know, out here at the bus stop and it was one of the kids that was doing this was my kid my oldest son he's in Colorado right now he's grown up a lot since those days thank you Lord but uh, there was a time when mom and dad weren't at the bus stop with him and we didn't go to the bus stop with him because you know kids go to the bus stop and and for whatever reason he thought it'd be great to just step out in the street and then jump back on the curb step out in the street jump back on the curb you know and you can do that for a while and maybe get away with it but eventually, a car is going to catch you. And when that happens, you're going to be in bad shape. And so what I'm telling you is don't play around with God. Stay in that secret place. Stay close to the Lord. Stay safe with Jesus Christ. Don't step outside of his will for you. Don't, don't, don't say, well, I know God says this, but don't have a but in there. Don't have that in there. That's called an excuse. And excuses ain't going to work with God. Follow his word. Obey his word. Be cheerful. Be glad. Be joyful. Love God with everything you have, everything you are. Love him with everything. And love those brothers and sisters you have in Christ the same way. Love them. Love them. You don't have to agree with one another on everything. You can still love a person and not not agree with every single point. Let me just tell you, man, we we are all different, right? We all are different. We all have different strengths and different weaknesses. We're all part of the body of Christ, aren't we? Love. Love them. You know, if there's an issue that they have, pray for them. But God will take care of that part. Pray for them. Pray for them. Not murmur, complain, gripe, and moan and groan. Don't do that. And certainly don't start gossiping because that is, that's horrible. You know, don't get idle in your time. If somebody's on your heart, your mind, you want to start talking about them, then you start talking to the Lord about them in prayer and thanking God for that person. Thank God for them. You know, just like I was telling you, God is so awesome that he puts people into your life You know, each person is unique. You know, each individual person on the planet is unique. There's no there's no two people that are identical. Even identical twins are not identical in everything. They're not. And God has given each one of you unique gifts, unique things about you. He's brought you through things in your life experiences, whatever. He's brought you to places where you can be beneficial to other people too. You can help one another. We're all a body of Christ and we're all you know, equally important. Every one of us. There's no big eyes and little U's. Not at all. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're in Christ. 
Now, if you're not in Christ and you don't know him, then you're not a brother and sister. You may be, you know, equal humanity. We're equal in, hum in, in our humanity for sure. But you need Jesus Christ. You need to be forgiven of sin just like I was forgiven of sin. Just like you, some of you were forgiven of sin. You've, tr you've repented. You trusted Jesus. There's no pride in that. Where's the pride? What did I do? I repented. I turned from my sin. I was guilty. I was guilty and, and absolutely earned a spot in hell. But God, through his mercy, gave me mercy instead of judgment. And he offers this to all mankind through Jesus Christ. He offers that to you. You know, there's no, there's nobody born holy. Let me just tell you that. The only one, there was only one that was, and his name is Jesus. The rest of us, no. We all need Christ. We all need the Savior. And I'm asking you today to turn to him. We talked about, yesterday, we talked about the crucifixion of Christ and all the things that he went through for you and, and me. And we see that he was despised and rejected. But this is not, this is not uh, something that's going to you know, continue to happen. When he returns, he's not despised and rejected by his people then. Then they're going to they're gonna mourn. They're going to weep. They're going to look on him and realize this is him. He's the one. We had rejected him. You know, the scripture tells us that they, they, when they look at Christ, they're going to say, this is, this, is, this is him. We have waited for him. Thank God for that. Are you waiting for Christ? Are you doing something while you're waiting for Christ? Like obeying his word? He gave a command for you to do something. He said, endure until the end. He wants you to be an overcomer. Him that overcomes, will he do these things? So God wants you to be an overcomer. He wants you to endure. He wants you to watch and pray. He wants you to be thankful in all things. He wants you to pray always with all prayer and supplication for the saints. He wants you to do those things. Above all these, return to your first love. That moment that you realized you love God and you wanted all of him and you turned from your sin and you trusted Jesus Christ. God wants that for you. He wants a close relationship. He wants you dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. He wants you there. He wants you there. And you can have that. Turn from your sin and trust Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen? Well, okay. Uh, tomorrow night... Um, I'm not sure if we'll have something tomorrow night, but Sunday morning, Sunday school, 9.30. And we'll have uh, worship um, on 10.30. And then again, uh, Sunday evening at 6 o'clock p.m. Now, I know that um, these are what we can, these are what we're offering online. But that doesn't mean that's the extent of your time of worship. I think that, you know, each one of us needs to be worshiping the Lord, not just during this time, not just, not just, this is not the extent of what we do. We should have that relationship all the time. Amen. So we should be worshiping and praising him always, all the time. Okay. So get into the word of God, study it, pray, encourage one another, call people and give them a good word of encouragement. You know, if you're reading through the scripture today, maybe, or t tomorrow morning, and you come up on a, a verse that really speaks to your heart, that you're like, wow, this is so powerful, call somebody and share it with them. Tell them what it, what it meant to you and how, how it impacted you. You know, people need that, especially today, especially during this time. Please be there for each other. Amen? Not too long ago, we talked about in church that there might be a day that you needed to stand on your own. Remember that? We talked about this just last year. We said maybe there'd be a day in the future, down the road. This is why I always tell you to get into the Bible for yourself. Because there might be a day where you have to stand on it, on your own. Now, thanks be to God, we're not completely on our own today. But you certainly have to stand. Just because you're at home doesn't mean that you can't live or, or you're not going to live a holy life. You need to live a holy life before the Lord. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. So live this word. 
live this word. Don't be a Christian in word in your speech only. But let that be a reflection. Let your speech be a reflection of what's going on in your heart and your life. Live for Jesus Christ, okay? Let's pray. Dearest Heavenly Father, I thank you for each one that's here tonight, that's tuned in tonight, and those that will tune in in the future. Lord, I pray that you would bless them. I pray that they would have a passion in their hearts for a relationship with you. God, I pray that they would love you with all of their heart, soul, and mind, that they would love their neighbors as themselves. I pray that the church would be busy about getting the word, the good news of the gospel to as many as we can while we have time. Dear Lord, I know that there are many dying and in, in slipping into hell without knowing you. Please, Lord, help us to reach as many as we can while we still have time. Pray this in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen and amen and amen. May God bless you guys. Love you. Stay with Jesus. Amen. There's no other way. One way, Jesus Christ. God bless. Have a good night.